What is morality, really? Obviously, it's a practice of conforming to some agreed-upon standard of right conduct. But is it our agreement about the standard that makes it right? Or is it right before we agree upon it? We all know that for a child to survive infancy, it'll require care and that we have a moral obligation to provide such care to the best of our ability. And yet most of us agree that wearing clothes in public is appropriate as well. But it isn't as obvious, especially in a warm climate, that this is necessary for anyone's survival. So what's the basis for our moral framework? Is everything just subjective? Are we just supposed to follow the current trends of our society and not rock the boat? To complicate all this, we also need to figure out how to do the right thing. As humans, we have this unique characteristic of knowing what's right while experiencing an often immediate impulse to avoid it. We know what we ought to do, but we'd rather just forget about it. Regardless of how we feel about what's right and wrong, we all want to be able to justify our actions, even if only to ourselves. But our framework for morality is only as reliable as its foundation. And as we're about to see, Christianity proposes that true morality isn't just rooted in a reliable source, but in a reliable person. Let's check it out. came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Teacher, which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So far in this series, we've discussed where we come from, who we are, and what our purpose is in creation, or as we stated it, our origin, our identity, and our meaning. It's been a journey of lighthearted discovery so far, but now we've arrived at what might be viewed as rough terrain. We've come to the point on the path where we must face up to the hard facts of morality. We must ask ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And if we want to be able to live with ourselves with a clear conscience hereafter, we're going to have to accept the answers as we find them, whether we like them or not. As with most real things, the question of morality seems incredibly simple on the surface, but it gets increasingly complicated, even messy, as you study it more closely. The Jews of the first century understood this when they tested Jesus, asking him which commandment was the most important. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. It only took Jesus four sentences to sum up the moral center of all the law and the prophets. Yet he spent years working primarily with just 12 men, helping his followers understand his message. So why is it so easy to state, but so complicated to get it right? Why is it so easy to miss the target? The answer is actually fairly easy to recognize. Just think of another discipline which involves aiming for a target. Think of archery. 
The goal of archery is simple. Shoot an arrow with a bow and hit a particular point on a target. You might accurately say that the whole practice of archery depends on this one goal. But pick up a bow and arrow and you will quickly realize how complicated this one goal really is. You have to hold the bow in the right way. You have to set your arrow in the right place on the string. You have to stand the right way. You have to worry about your posture. You have to worry about your eyesight. You have to consider whether the wind is blowing. You have to estimate how far you are from the target. All this and more has to be considered before you even take aim. And when at last you do take aim, you come to the part where you have to strain to pull back the bowstring and keep straining while you hold your bow and arrow steady in order to take your shot. All of this is necessary to achieve that seemingly simple, single goal of just hitting a particular point on a target. When it comes to morality, Christ hit the target while we were both unable and unwilling to hit it ourselves, and he offers us justification in himself. Our ideas of how he accomplished this are called the theories of atonement, and there are three of these theories that are argued for more than any others. The first theory is called substitutionary atonement. In this view, the gospel, that is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, is all about how God laid the just penalty for our sin on Jesus, and in this way granted us forgiveness, righteousness, and reconciliation with himself. Advocates of this view make a strong case for their argument by appealing to passages such as Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. The second theory is called the Christus Victor theory of atonement. In this view, the gospel is the story of how Christ won the victory over every power that separates mankind and creation from God. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58 is one of the cornerstones for this view. The third theory might be called the moral example theory. The main idea which this view teaches is that Christ set a perfect example for humanity to follow. As the archetype of incarnate righteousness, Jesus revealed in himself the perfection that we should aspire to, and through him will one day possess. 1 John 2, 5 through 6 might be used as a defense for this theory. Theologians have engaged in heated arguments over which of these theories is supreme. Interestingly enough, they can all muster a hefty arsenal of scriptural support for their viewpoints. So which one is right? Which one really is supreme? Actually, I kind of think the answer is all three. Christ did pay the just sacrifice for our sin. He won the necessary victory over everything that separates us from God. And he set a perfect example for us that we must follow. If we disregard any of these theories, I think we miss an important element of faith in Christ and in all that he accomplished. Would we be willing to argue that his death wasn't a necessary sacrifice or that he didn't need to win the perfect victory or that making the decision to follow him doesn't require following his example? Faith in Christ necessarily involves embracing all three views. It is only when we begin to exclude one view or exalt one over another that we fall into dangerous territory. For how could we say that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice if he did not live a perfectly moral life? Or how could we claim that he accomplished a perfect victory without justice being fully satisfied? Of course, at this point it seems that we've wandered far off course. This video was supposed to be about morality, and we're talking about the competing theories of the atonement. But we need to remember the illustration of an archer hitting a target. As we discovered, that seemed like such a simple exercise when in fact it was deeply complicated. And morality is even more complicated than shooting an arrow and hitting a target. Because when it comes to morality, we all know we ought to hit the target, but we quite often just don't want to. We even know which way we ought to shoot, and we know more or less what it'll take to hit the mark, but we would much rather just forget the whole business and walk away. 
This is one of the fundamental reasons we need to understand Christ's atoning work. While we were both unable and unwilling to atone for our own iniquity, Christ accomplished everything that is required of us. By offering himself as the perfect sacrifice, by winning the ultimate victory, and by living the morally perfect life, he reconciled us to God and to the eternal life that can be experienced only when we attain a proper relationship with him. And within this restored relationship, he's ready to equip us with power through the Spirit to overcome all things, to be conquerors. But it is not only true that we all at one time were unable or unwilling to atone for our own iniquity. Our inability and unwillingness remain distinctive elements of our character to this day. The Apostle Paul expressed his struggle with this reality in Romans 7. He writes, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. Instead, I keep on doing the evil I do not want to do. If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So this is the principle I have discovered. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my body, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. A critical thing to note here is that Paul is not discussing the struggle that he had with sin before he became a believer. He's talking about feeling captive to the law of sin at the present time. Paul's admitting that as a leader, as a missionary, as a disciple of Christ, even as an apostle, he has a sin problem. He can see the target. He knows he should shoot for it, but he feels unequal to the task. What a wretched man I am, he proclaims. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Again, take a moment to consider the tense of the question. Paul's not looking back to a past struggle, but instead asking who will save him at present. He's acknowledging his present and constant need for deliverance. But then he finds it. Thanks be to God, he cries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we own up to the obligations of right and wrong that lie constantly before us, the crucial thing to understand is that the saving work of Christ is not just something that happened a long time ago, but is something that is still happening right now, right where we are, right in the middle of all the trials, temptations, and confusion that we're facing at the moment. Jesus hit the mark on our behalf, but as the infinite word, the power of his work never ceases to manifest its potency. I want to be absolutely clear here. If we claim to love Christ, we are called to heed the message of Scripture without compromise. If we claim to be his followers and yet reject his clear teaching and that of his prophets and apostles, we are just pretending. Christianity isn't a designer religion. We can't make it what we want it to be or change its size or shape to fit our preferences. There is a real evil in the world, but not just in the world, it's in each one of us as well, and we're called to crucify it and follow Christ. Consider just a few passages that touch on this issue. In 1 John 2, we read, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. In 1 John 3, we read, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. 
Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And in Luke 9, Christ says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Our road is clear. We must reject sin and cling to a life of following Christ, walking as he walked and conforming to his teaching. Yet here's the key thing to remember. We're capable of living for Christ only when we find our life and power in Christ. We cannot hit the mark apart from him. Any attempt even to take aim without him is unthinkable. Without him, we have nothing to shoot with and nothing to shoot for. He's the substance of righteousness itself, without which righteousness has no meaning whatsoever. Abide in me, he says, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Christ is our source, our life, and our strength. He is the active force, the possessive force, which he grants through the Spirit that we have to learn to rely on. There is no conquering sin without relying on its conqueror. Christ is our only hope and our only assurance that, though we will stumble, he will carry us onward to perfection. Therefore, as we consider the question of morality and the obligations of right and wrong, taking into account every gray area and all the painful clarity, the complicated becomes simple again. All morality is truly dependent on one thing, abiding in Christ. If we give ourselves wholly to that aim, our actions will take care of themselves. The question then is whether we are willing to do that one simple thing. Will we choose to abide in Christ? If we're honest, we'll find that we have to rely on Him even to help us rely on Him. We need Him to make us willing, even to be willing. Thanks for hanging out with me as we discuss the question of morality. Next time, we're going to dive into the question of destiny and then take a turn and consider how God uses the universal experiences of human agency to continually draw all things toward himself. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, or share the video if you liked it. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.